So I'm gonna get started here. Uh, I really appreciate you all joining me for my session um, from Balsamic. It's pro-level UI design tips for beginners, um, but it's really for anyone, especially people who are not like me that obsess over UI design and typography. Um, my name is Billy Carlson. As I said, it's, it is also William M. Carlson, but I go by Billy Carlson. I'm a design educator at Balsamic, which means I create educational content not just for the balsamic community, but for anyone trying to learn how to create better digital products. I'm really excited to be here. I love all of the Rosenfeld conferences and books and everything, and I'm very honored to be able to speak to you today. And I just want to say that the session is not so much about how to use balsamic. We have tons of great tutorials how to do that on our website. This is more about leveling up a few key skills uh, in UI design using wireframes or pretty much any low fidelity design technique. I did want to mention that we are writing a book and I have, I'm not going to tell you who the uh, publisher is, but we're writing a book and here's a mock-up of it. And a lot of the content, actually all the content from today can be found in a few chapters of our book, plus a whole lot more. Uh, I'm really excited about it. We've been working on it for over a year now. It is going to be called wireframing. So balsamic writing a book about wireframing, but it's a lot more than that. It's what we refer to as uh, a new, a newer version of the non-designers design book or a new designers design book. So we're hoping that you'll get a lot from it. And uh, I'm really excited for this to come out. Look for some more info uh, in a few weeks, but we still have a few months to go. Writing a book is hard, but it's totally worth it. I'm sure other speakers here can understand that. Okay, so I want to dive right into the content. I have about 20 minutes or so uh, of stuff that I'm going to cover, and then we will do Q&A. But the principles that I want to cover, I truly feel like anyone can understand and learn and apply to any visual design that they're making. Um, so they are hierarchy, which I think is the primary thing that you can do to an application interface or a website interface to help us guide guide the user through what we want them to do and see alignment which is aligning and spacing elements for easy scanning of content and then providing clarity so designing for intuition and quick understanding of the interface okay so mastering visual hierarchy is the first step in creating easy to use effective ui which is totally true we uh we use hierarchy uh, as a way to guide us to like have a nice good flow through an application through a website to make it easy and almost seamless for us to know where we're supposed to be looking and when and it could be created through color contrast scale grouping spacing um, a lot more so this is one of the images I actually have created for a book i've seen this image go around a lot on the, the design twitters and i think it's just a great example of what hierarchy can do to uh, the to the audience to the viewer so as you could see this reversed out white box with the blue text is the first thing that's going to um, attract my eye and then i'll probably likely move to the next biggest thing and then there and then there so that's just it's sort of designing for our subconscious and how we'd actually look at these things and it's important to know that because you can design for it so here's a few images that we have in the book one would be using a contrasting color to draw your attention. So changing a sign up button from a, a more muted color to something that stands out is going to place it at the higher level of hierarchy on the page. And then you'll, you'll start there and then slowly move down uh, the page to read more. What's interesting too when I talk about hierarchy is a lot of this happens almost instantaneously when you look at a screen on a page. The next is just simply placement. So if there's not a lot of contrast or other visual noise above it, whatever's at the top of the page will be seen and read first. And then to push that even further, um, giving enough space and white space around elements. So white space will draw attention to something because it's just sort of floating there in a good way where it pops and it's I could see it first. And also just using proper spacing will increase hierarchy and make it flow better. So my favorite example to use is, and if you've seen any of my talks, I do, <laughs> I do too much on sports. I look it up on the internet a bit too much, but ESPN's website is uh, <laughs> lacking pretty much all of these things that I've been talking about. 
it's very difficult for me to know where I'm supposed to start on the page and then where I should move to next. I don't see a flow here. All I'm seeing is uh, a lot of different boxes of content that may be pulling my attention in different directions, which is not good when I wanna be searching for as many sort of headlines I would like to read as possible. A website that I think does a really good job of it is The Athletic. It is like a newcomer to the sports media landscape but their homepage is very simple and it's very easy for me to scan and to look at. And it's because it has proper hierarchy. So they always have one main um, attention grabbing headline with the big image. So I'm staring at Clayton Kershaw here. And then I move a little bit to the right and it's easy for me to like see what these headlines are because of the second biggest thing. And then if I move further to the right, we just have a list. So here I'm able to read, I'm not even gonna count, but maybe 12 headlines of, of options I may wanna pick. And if I move down, it's, it's just, it's designed in a way that I know how to flow, how to flow through it easily, seamlessly without thinking about it. So this does not always have to do, like hierarchy is not always just in marketing websites, but applications can use this really well too. I like Spotify as an example of a really good hierarchy, um, a really good hierarchy in an application. So if you look at this screen, I can just tell by looking at it what the first three things and in what order my eyes are drawn to. I have a lot of practice. I teach this stuff, so I know how to see it. So what I tell people is if you want to look for hierarchy, if you're interested in like, how do I do this? How do I notice it very easily? We do something called a squint test or a blur test. It's just as easy as squinting your eyes or blurring the image to see what is popping on the page. And is that what you want to be popping on the page? This is a very, very obvious example of the play button for this album is the number one thing I would see. The next would be the album plus the title, the album artwork plus the title, and then the set list. So I know where to go. And then the fourth would probably be the navigation over here, which is exactly what I want people to be looking at. Now, if we go back to ESPN and we do the blur test, I don't know where to start here. Like these two images are really popping. This is, this is, there's a lot happening on here that's not making it, it's not making it easy for me to find a place for my, I to not only land, but to start and to go to next. So for this talk, I actually had one of my students create wireframes as example exercises that we can use um, to show how you can apply hierarchy alignment and clarity within wireframes. So here is an example of a site sort of like petfinder.com. And it's a good wireframe. It has all the content we want on it. It's just not designed yet, right? And that happens a lot in the early wireframing stage. So you're trying to get all your ideas out. You're trying to get all the content you want on the page and that's fine. But now you're at a stage where you know that all the content's good. We need to start leveling up the design so that it's actually easy to use. So if I wanna go show potential clients, uh, potential users or show a developer how I want to make my site, it'll look a lot better, the easier to understand. So. Just understand. So for me, if I'm going to go to uh, adopt a pet website, I want to think of what are the, the main actions I want the user to do. For me, it would be searching for pets first. Next would be probably understanding where I can sign in or log into my account. And then the third would be browsing. And then four might be more details of like exactly the mechanics of adopting a pet. Right. So if we do a, if we do a squint test here, all of those elements are available available to me on the screen, but it's hard for me to sort of start somewhere and flow. So if I want to start searching, log in, and then browse, it's not as easy for me to quickly grasp that and do it. So here is a video of me redesigning the screen very quickly. I decided to go opt for recording myself designing these instead of uh, instead of doing it on the fly, just in case there was tech issues. But so the first thing I do is I make sure that that navigation is not the, the brightest thing on the page. The second thing I do is change not only the location of this login sign up, but the style of it. Login and sign up have to be, uh, sign up has to be the primary and login has to be the secondary action. 
So just changing um, that will make it much easier. I also changed the color to be a little brighter. For the search area, I found that the search size and everything was fine. It was really big. It worked out perfectly. Uh, it just needed more space. It needed that white space around it. So that took me, without speeding up time, it took me probably five minutes to change the design. So now the hierarchy is I'm staring at a big search button. I can notice the sign in button over here if I need to go to my account. And the next thing would be images of pets for adoption. So browsing, so search, login, browsing. Okay, and here's the final design. All of these things are just understanding how you can apply these simple visual design um, principles to your design to make them so much easier to understand and use. Okay, so the next one I'm going to talk about is proper alignment. And I think this is sort of next level after hierarchy, which is um, making sure you spend time with the content to craft it in the interface and understand how people are going to use it. A big part of alignment is making it easy to scan. So you're setting up, you're, you're crafting the layout so it's easy for me to read all those headlines. Uh, one of the examples we use in the book is the Atlantic's website, which I think they do a great job of alignment and hierarchy. But one of the biggest principles I tell people just to keep it simple is you can have your big hierarchy areas in the middle. But if you have tons of content you want people to read and scan, you need to align text with text and images with images. You could do it vertically or horizontally images, text. This allows me to easily scan all the different content pieces on the page to pick and choose where I want to go to next. If you scroll down the page of the Atlantic, they have the same, the same design. I think it's great, you know, avatars of writers, names, but headlines, I could read all the headlines or look at the images. They're not mixed up together. It's an easy flow for me to just scan, to scan. And another thing I really like here too is that they have the numbers. So this is the most popular, the ranked, and all the numbers are here. They're not in line with the text to sort of disrupt my flow. And you know who else does this really well is the athletic. They, they follow the same principle, text with text, images with images. Um, even And so even icons are considered images, symbols, anything. So don't have those in line. So these bullet points on the outside make it easy for me to just scan all that. And then they even do it here across the bottom where all of these uh, tweets are uh, easy for me to read. I can scan all this content in fractions of a, maybe a second or something and pick where I wanna go. Um, and this is smooth. And you know who doesn't do this? ESPN does not do a good job for scanning. We have some headlines here, but it kind of gets interrupted here. Um, it's just, if you follow your eyes patterns, very zigzag, they use this sort of design a lot. If you go to their website right now, it has a lot of these big, big things here. It's a lot easier if I can just scan the content quickly. So a way that you can uh, apply alignment to any layout of text and images is using a grid. This is a uh, one of the first things you learn when you go to design school, graphic design school specifically, excuse me, is um, the importance of grid layouts and how that they could be used to not only uh, align elements, but understand the proportions between them. But aligning is where we're gonna stick. And I wanna say is that we've started it in print design, we've carried it over to web design, software design, and every major, um, platform of uh, every major framework for building uh, building web products, digital products, all have uh, grid systems built inside them. So iOS and Android, um, Foundations, Bootstrap, they all have a grid and that uh, you could use it and it's written into the code and it allows you to much easier layout of pages. So I just have two examples of wireframes just showing you how a grid can work. Um, this is a standard 12 column grid on a very typical marketing type website. You divide the pages up, uh, you divide the sections of the pages up within the grid. Um, the content that goes in each of these sections can also and should also be aligned to the grid. And it helps you uh, place elements on the page in a nice, neat way. 
But what I wanted to say is you can use that exact same grid in software. So here's a wireframe of Spotify, like album page, and it also follows a grid. And uh, what it does is it allows us to keep things in proportion to each other. And uh, it does a really good job. So grids are not just for web pages, marketing sites are for applications too. In my example for this one, we, I sort of recreated the ESPN article um, a homepage that I did not like in a fictional Balsamic Times uh, newspaper. So, as you could see, it's well, it's, as you could see, it's it's pretty scattered, and it's like I can't easily I can't easily scan the site. There's not a lot of things that are aligned to each other, and when you align things, it sort of anchors the eye to choose where I want to look. And right now, it makes it very difficult to choose where I want to look. So it has the effect of bad hierarchy as well. So here's uh, what I did first. So I'm going to have this quick video play. But what I did first was I created a 10 column grid and overlaid it on the design. And then I just started slowly, even though it sped up slowly, moving items within the grid and lining them up together. Um, so I'm messing with the header first and I'll mess with that. But as you can see, it's just as simple as, as lining everything up. And uh, I started with the hero area, but I know because <laughs> I made it that I, I changed it in a little bit. But leaving the hero area as the big uh, primary piece, you know, the, the big hero area uh, content on the homepage. And then every other piece of content should be treated secondary to that. So what I do is, I make it, um, I follow my principle of images and images and text with text and actually doing a quick adjustment here. But what I want to do is make it easier for um, everyone to scan the content down the page. I'm going to have tons of text written. And if I can separate the text and images, you know, sort of weaving through and I can make it text with text and images with images, it's going to be far easier. Um, I had a little more text here, but also if you need to have big, bright, <laughs> I didn't know where to put that little box. If you have big, bright images, you can just make them taller and they will stand out. They'll have a lot more weight to it. And as you could see, I sort of took the, um, down here, I have the bullet points outside of the, of the grid line because that's an image. It's images with images, text with text. So now it's easier for me to, uh, easier for me to scan. I'm making some changes here, but I think I'm just going to skip ahead. I want to have time for Q&A. Well, now I kind of want to see what happens. Okay, so I sort of messed with it, but as you can see here from side by side, this is the original. And again, it's hard for me to sort of pick each of these text areas to pick from, uh, to choose, to scan and read. I've redesigned it so the hero area stands out the most, but then all the other text is lined up together. And it makes it much easier for me to scan all of that text almost instantly to pick where I want to go. Okay, so that's alignment. And now let's talk about clarity. So clarity means that the interface behaves in a way that I'm going to expect. So it allows me to feel comfortable even when I'm using something new. And it makes me feel like I can master it or I'm in control of the experience. In the book, we write that there's three types of clarity. Clarity of structure, which is using recognizable patterns, not only within your application, but um, using patterns that exist on other sites uh, that are common to this, you know, common. Uh, clarity of content, making sure that, <clears throat> excuse me, clarity of content, making sure that what is written on the page is just enough to get the job done, to explain what needs to be explained, not showing too much, not showing too little, and then clarity of action and making sure that the most important actions in the page are obvious. So here's an example from an article uh, from Nielsen Norman Group that I think does a great job explaining clarity. So uh, what we have here is, uh, it's actually an article about UI copy, which is really interesting, but what they do in their redesign is they strip away a lot of content. So that's the, the uh, 
clarity of content, right? We don't need all of these words here to explain what the action the user has to take. Having them have to take the time to read this can confuse them and lose focus. And we don't need that. We just need to be very clear and concise. So removing that is important. This actual screen, I kind of jumped ahead, but this screen is showing clarity of structure by following the, the more standard Windows modal uh, design and separating the cancel button and treating it separately from, from what's inside here. So redesigning this, taking away the cancel and putting its design over here makes it clear to me that what that is without even having to really stare at it, it just, it's not a primary button. So I just know that this is gonna be canceled just from my experience of using Windows. So it allows me to just focus here and read these. And then the words are very, very clear because it says, you know, save and don't save. So it doesn't have extra words in it to trip me up. I can just glance at it. I understand my options and I can continue. So I think it's a really good example of providing clarity to a user. So again, this is clarity of structure. It follows the Windows design patterns, keeps the, you know, the third cancel option away from the two primary. Removing the extra text is the clarity of content. And then combining the two makes it easy for me to uh, take action and understand what my options are almost instantaneously. Okay, so here's one more example of clarity uh, the opposite way. So I signed up for Audible and I enjoyed it and then I decided I want to cancel. So when I signed up, it was very easy for me to understand. I take a look at this screen and it makes sense to me. I click here. It's very clear, right? The, the text is clear. You're getting a free audiobook. Okay, I want to do that. Um, this is fine, but this right here allows me a clarity of action. The structure is right, one primary button. Everything to me here makes sense as a good design. So I had Audible, I listened to some great audiobooks, and I decided it was time to cancel. And then this is one of the steps of the canceling process, right? And this is intentionally unclear. So the structure of the page is not very standard. Um, the use of three primary buttons so that I have to read each button is not very standard. This is all done uh, intentionally to allow me to reconsider if I would like to um, cancel or not. Um, sorry. So I think this is, and people like say this is a dark pattern. And the way that you would change this is all you need to do is switch those top buttons to be secondary to the primary, and then adding a lot of space here, adding some proximity, some white space, so that I can. I can know what is the primary action I want to take in the page, but you can also again design to allow users a second to pause and have to read the screen so you can use a lack of clarity to control the experience if that's what you want to do and you could do it for positive too. it doesn't always have to be for. Trying to convince them to stay at your uh, your product so here's one quick uh, design example of using. And I think this is a really good one because I see a lot of wireframes like this, especially from non designers or even UX designers who aren't really spending a lot of time with the interface design. So they'll throw all the content onto a wireframe and say, here you go. Now, this is just glancing at it, it's not very clear. There's three buttons, but they're not primary or secondary. Uh, one of the buttons doesn't even need to be a button. The form fields, uh, uh, input fields, sorry, are not clear exactly what info and using slang and shortened abbreviations are not going to help people understand what they're supposed to do with it. So I'm just going to show you a quick redesign um, just to make this absolutely clear. So the first thing is the forgot password button needs to be text. And that's a design pattern you'll see everywhere. We don't need to repeat the word Flickr. We can just sign up for an account. Changing these. I don't mind having icons within an input field. It's not totally necessary. Having explainer text is necessary, um, but it could be helpful. So um, just making it an actual input field 
design, proper design will help. You don't need to shorten and abbreviate obvious things to make it easy for people. So, I mean, that was very, very quick for this one. I wish oh, I'm gonna pause it. I do the sign up page too. So it was very quick. And now this page is a lot clearer what my options are using structure, using um, standard design principles, cleaning up the text so that's easier for me to understand what's being asked of me. And then again, changing that to a primary button is also making it obvious what the action is on the page. So I also do the sign up page. I have a few minutes left, so I'll do this page up. Oh. <laughs> well, too late. No, I'll fast forward. I have the time. So we also have a sign up page, which I want to pause on really quick. A lot of times this is, again, what I'll see in a wireframe is the contents there or the suggested content, but it's not designed right or it's not in the right placement. And you can spend the extra five minutes reorganizing this so that it's clear what you're asking of the user. So here we're asking for birthday, which is information that's not needed and could trip someone up. If you want to have someone's birthday in their account, I would ask for it later. Your job is to sort of get them into their account and start using their application quickly. So like that's the first thing I remove. And then the order of the um, the order of the input fields to me is wrong because it'd be name, email, password. So that's something that I'm going to expect as a common, you know, I use a lot of web products. It would be very weird to start with password. And again, just making sure that I'm clear what each of these input fields are and what my options are to put in them will help me make it make my decision quicker. There is actually no the sign up button was a secondary account uh, secondary button, which I should change here. But again, all these little changes make it extremely clear what I'm supposed to do. Okay, and then here's the two designs. And that's all I had for today. I want to call out that we have lots of this content on our Balsamic Wireframing Academy, balsamic.com slash learn. And you could sign up for updates about our book at balsamic.com slash book. Feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm in the Design Ops Slack channel. You have my email. Balsamic has a Slack channel. Uh, that's all I have. I'm really thankful that you were here to watch this and that's it i'm ready for some q a so i'm going to stop sharing and see if anyone has any questions i don't know if you need me to unmute so maybe you can let me know <laughs> and i see there's some questions but i will share the slides Ooh, I like this Web3 design. That's a good question. If anyone has any questions, let me know through the chat and I could probably um, unmute you if I figure it out. You think I would know this stuff by now, how often we've used these. Ooh, so we have a question from Casey, who I used to work with. Hi. <laughs> so this is a really good question because it's a really awesomely easy answer, and I deal with this all the time. Uh, she says, which, uh, if any of your principles are more challenging for folks with different backgrounds, e.g. engineering? And the number one thing that we have difficulty with as designers explaining to non-designers is alignment. That does not make sense to someone um, who is designing all the time in software, because to be honest with you, trying to align things while you're writing code is not a fun job, especially because we have different screen sizes, we have responsive, um, we can't control the size of the user's window no matter what. And so number one thing that I still argue with is, do we wanna put the extra effort in engineering to align elements? And a lot of times I say yes, because the misalignment is what will throw off. Will, we use the word cognitive load a lot in UX design. I'm sure all of you know what that is. And that adds to the cognitive load is trying to sort of parse through and separating 
text with text and images with images really helps you scan a lot. I'm sure the other ones too. Um, so yes, I will share the slides. Uh, so the other question is about adapting these principles for Web3 design. And so far, my experience of Web3 design doesn't change the interfaces that we're looking at. You can do more with the technology. So I can connect my wallet. I can interact more, but it's still digital interfaces. And I think that you would want to follow good design principles regardless. And there, I hope there's no more echo on my mic. I missed that from a half hour ago. <laughs> I guess my time is up, but I don't have anywhere to go. So I'm just sitting here in an empty classroom. Let's see if I can mute or unmute anyone. I used to be a whiz at this Zoom stuff, but I'm not anymore. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm sure you have other uh, sessions to attend. So I think we're good and uh, I appreciate it. And please, I look forward to feedback always.